Okay. Thanks for saying, and I totally agree. Don't go to the orange juice. Here is better. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Stephanie. And yay. So, this lasted five seconds, but when you're stressed and on stage, sometimes time doesn't work the same way. So what I want to talk to you about today is the difference between objective time, which is what you can actually measure, like how long does it take for my website to launch and how long before I can see the first pixel on the page and all of those performance metrics, and psychological time. So psychological time is how we actually perceive time as human beings. Yeah. Do you need me to? Okay, better? Yeah, so psychological time and perception. The first thing we need to do is kind of try to understand how the human brain works. There's a lot of, okay. There's a lot of external factors that might kind of affect your perception of speed. The first one usually is how fast can you interact with the page? That's why you hear and listen and read all of those things about uh, critical CSS path and stuff like that. So having something displayed really, really quickly on the top of the page, even if what's beneath the fold, I hate this expression, that doesn't mean anything with mobile phones like that and stuff like that, but still. So being in able to interact really quickly with the page is pretty important for users because then they have the impression that the page is faster than it actually really is. Then a uh, user profile plays a lot of uh, role. Like younger audience, they're more demanding. So if you're designing for teenager, million, millennials and stuff like that, you'll have to make your website way more faster because demanding audience. And then there's the state of mind. If you're calm and relaxed, you're more willing to wait. If you're in a rush, if you're hurried, if you're like stressed and stuff like that, the perception of time is completely different. And then return on investment for waiting time. If you spend already like 10 minutes selecting your champion and League of Legends and you know that you're going to play a 45 minutes game, you might be willing to wait for two minutes, two minutes for the game to load. If you're on the train or looking for like the next train schedule or stuff like that, you might not be willing to wait two minutes for the page to load. So again, it's all about return on investment, even for users who are actually waiting. And then the perception of speed, the, so not the real speed you can measure, but also the perception, plays a really, really big role on user satisfactions. Some sites are really low, like Amazon used to be really low to load. But users were able to do what they wanted to do on a website really quickly. So they rated the website as being fast, while if you measured the thing, it wasn't. But again, they were able to do what they wanted to do in an easy way. So they perceived it as being really fast. So if perception of speed plays such a role, how can we enhance that for our users? The first thing we can do that's not super complicated to implement is having a responsive interface. So responsive not in the sense of responding to the browser side, but really in like responsive to user interactions. Between zero and 300 milliseconds, you kind of need to provide these visual keys like UI elements to show that the interface is responsive. So for instance, this is micro interactions. So it can be as easy as just having a button, a hover effect, an active effect, stuff like that. Show to the users that what they, the action they took, there's gonna be an answer soon. And this is the, the designer's job. I don't know if you work with a lot of designers, but I hear a lot of developers complain that their designer doesn't provide them with all of the states. Well, it's my job, it's our job as a designer. So ask for those states because it's super important. And this is when we usually do, we do style guides and in those style guides you have all of the buttons and how they work. Or like I showed you before, like some really quick CSS animations. 
between 30, uh, 300 milliseconds and one second, this is like a normal delay, you can do much. Then between two and five seconds, it kind of starts to be complicated because no users are waiting and they, they are aware that they're waiting. So you need to actually do something about that. Um, this is where you're gonna use like, you know, the first one. Uh, those kind of spinners. The idea is to show the users that the interface is actually working, that it didn't froze, so that they know that something is going on in the background or stuff like that. But you don't have necessarily the, you don't really need to tell them how long they might wait. You might even not know about it yet. And um, sorry about, so it looks like that. Sorry about people with epileptic issues in the room, so I'm gonna re go really quickly. But it's also where you can get creative, like do fun stuff for cat, a loader, stuff like that, gears, for whatever reason. So this is this kind of looping and determinated loader things so that you can make the user wait. And uh, Trainline is doing something really, really nice about that. They show some brand identity. So this is a service that lets you book uh, trains online. Why doesn't it? Okay, so here it is. This is part of their brand identity. You book train tickets, so they have this cute little train loader. More than five seconds, yeah, things get complicated. You've kind of reached the tolerance for not giving users in any information. So you can't just take with those looping loaders. You need something more. So a few advice. First, the users are more willing to wait if you explain to them why they need to wait. Uh, we transfer those it really, really nicely. So they tell you like, you need to, s we are currently uh, sending this to one person and then show you the weight of the file. So with a file that big, you understand that, yeah, that might actually take time. It doesn't make sense for me to wait. Then, progression, if you can. Tell them what's going on and how it is progressing. Like, don't let them wait. So this was really quick, so I was willing to wait. But if I have a really, really slow connection and I see that the progression doesn't really go, like I've been waiting for it to go to one person, two person for one minute, maybe I don't wanna wait. So if possible, don't block the users. Like here, I'm, I'm on a really bad network connection, so what I can do here is cancel and go back later on a better connection. Like when something needs time, you don't want to block the people. You can also do things in the background. That's what a lot of softwares do now. Like you upload something really, really heavy. You can still play around with the rest of the interface. And then you get a, a little notification somewhere once it's ready. So again, if the waiting time is really long, don't block the users. That's a really bad idea. And 10 seconds is about the limit. Like after that, so you can't really keep users attention focused anymore. So, how do you keep users attention span when you have like a free, um, yeah, 30 seconds, 40 seconds uh, wait for queries and user complain? So this is what happened. A friend of mine uh, told me like, we optimize every piece of code we could. So they optimized the database, they optimized the front end, they couldn't optimize any piece of code. There was no code left to optimize but there were a lot of queries. They needed to search through the database for different stuff and uh, users with really heavy queries were waiting like 30, 40 seconds for the interface to load. So he asked me, what can we do? Because we put one of those loaders and people are still complaining. And I said, yeah, of course, <laughs> you're taking their attention and you're showing them the spinner forever. That's, you need something more. You need something valuable to your users. And this is the solution their design team came up with after I gave them a few advice. So you have to understand, these clients, they are shipping containers through all Europe and through the whole world. They're in Marseille and like seagulls is something really important in their cultural identity. So what they did, instead of having this boring spinner, they had this cute little seagull. And it was wildly approved. My friend couldn't believe it. it was, we removed it, we put a, single, a seagull, and everybody was happy about that. Because it spoke to them. It's like they way are having something ping pong. They can't put like beer loaders, stuff like that. It's a corporate company, but a seagull. 
And they did another thing, they put information. So while you are waiting, you actually see this. Hello, query. Okay, the query. You've got the cute little signal and you have information that is important to your company. So you can even like click on that, check the article, come back and it's loaded. So what they did, they had something that spoke to their users and they also distracted the users with something interested to them. So even if you're a super corporate company, you can still put some personality and a little bit of fun. It, you don't have to have all of those, those really, really boring loaders. So another technique to make it look fast is animations and transitions. So this is again a little bit heavy, but you couldn't animate the transition between two pages because here, you see a lot of SVG, really heavy pages. It takes a lot of time to load. So what they did is like. Okay, sorry. So yeah, the cute, the cute transition between both pages so that they have time to load the things in the background and users don't wait with a blank page. Another thing, uh, so this is a demo by Leva. Valhead, she does really, really interesting stuff with CSS. And animating arrival and departures on the screen is also something interesting. Because here you get the extra seconds to create the element into the database. You also, you also give the user this kind of spatial aid on the interface. They know that the things come from the left and go back to the right. So it helps them again kind of understand the interface and it makes it feel a little bit more smoother. If you're stuck with progress bars, <laughs> that happens. There's two tricks, so this is based on actual uh, scientific studies. The first thing is like, um, we remember first things and last things. So you can make the progress bar feel more satisfying if you speed it towards the end, because then users will remember the speeding part at the end and not the rest of the waiting time. And then there's another little trick, which is with ribbons. So this is not trendy anymore. But you see it go to the right side, and the ribbon goes into the other direction. So this is just like visual tricks to make the progress bar feel a little bit faster, even if like the actual waiting time doesn't really change. So I applied some of those techniques in the Ionic application. We had uh, an application for uh, home surveillance. You could ask for a recording. So you have to imagine somebody uh, who just got an intrusion alert on their uh, mobile application, like, hey, somebody is trying to go into your home. So you need to understand the level of stress of this person, and they can ask for a recording. So first thing first, discussing with the development team to kind of understand how this was going to work. And I have assumed this was not going to be easy because you have the cameras into uh, the user's whole houses that send a video to the server. The issue is that the format of this video is not web compliant, is not mobile compliant, so we need to re-encode this video on our servers to then send it to the mobile application. And then can take a lot of time to do that. So at some point we were even wondering if it wasn't going to be faster to just like take JPEGs of the video, send it to the, the mobile app and create this kind of frame by frame animation instead of a real video. So we had a lot of discussions with the development team on that one. So what we decided to do is like deconstructing the waiting time, milliseconds by milliseconds. So between zero and 30, what I told you before, we have an animation between the two views. Then the player, uh, it, the player UI is slowly displaying on the screen because we'll always have at least three seconds to wait because of the encoding part of the system. Then we have an indeterminated waiting indicator because we don't really know how long we need to wait. Depends on the, the data, depends on the, on the Wi-Fi, depends on the video, stuff like that. And then we play the video as soon as it's loaded into the browser. So it kind of looks something like that. Transition, slowly, then thinner, and once it's there, we, we display it. This is, then you don't have this kind of blank page with a user waiting for the, the recording. 
they still have a few steps to enhance the waiting time. So then you need to uh, discuss this with the development team. So how do you build that as a designer? Well, usually what I do is a little bit like people are doing animation. You do this kind of step-by-step uh, mockup. So this is how it's going to work. This is the system at different kind of steps. You don't only design the final steps. You need to design all the in-between little pages. And then I have written documentation for the developers. So usually I do animated GIFs. I have a lot of documentation and explain to them what's expected. This helps me build something that is sustainable. Also, if the developer team aren't in my office or things like that, this helps us communicate a lot. Then another technique is you don't always need to wait for a server to respond, to display something to the users. You can cheat or more elegantly, uh, you, can, you can be optimistic. So Twitter does that in a really nice way. When you like a tweet, they don't wait for the server re respond to change it. Then you've got the server respond wait later. So they already change the color of the tweets. And then when the server responds, they increment the, um, the little thing. What happens in, in case of failure is you didn't like the tweet. Okay, that's fine with them. So they don't really mention to you if it didn't work, but they still do this into an optimistic way. So we did that again for my home surveillance alarm. First step is trust your API. <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> really complicated sometimes, but you need to test your API. So you need to make sure that in most cases, sh things should work fine. So what we did, uh, you can switch the alarm on and off remotely. So what we did is we when users ask for the switch, uh, we change it into the interface immediately, even if the server didn't respond. But we're not Twitter. What will be the consequences of a failure system from my user's perspective? Well, the consequences will be somebody entering the home, <coughs> thinking the alarm was switched off, and it wasn't. Then they got this notification and then they asked for a recording, you know, to make sure that actually it's not an intrusion and stuff like that. So not a great user experience at all. We need to make sure here that if there's a failure, we inform the users because again, we're not Twitter and this is like way more critical situation. So first step usually when you dealing with designing for failure is identify <laughs> again all of the failure. I have uh, been working on an application where we have this double entry table with all of the potential failures, all of the errors and like priority, uh, is it high priority, low priority, stuff like that. So then inform users something went wrong and if possible, sometimes you can't, but if possible, uh, tell users how to fix this. So what happens is as soon as we get the server respond, if uh, the alarm didn't get off, we put this, oh, I'm sorry. So there's a red notification <laughs> here. So if users are still into the application, they get this toast into the app. If they're not, we use the iOS or Android notification system. I'm not super fan about notifying users about anything, so you need to be super careful with that because we get notified a lot all day long. So you really want to use the notification system from the, the phone of the users in case of an um, emergency. Um, I think this is kind of a case of emergency, like not having somebody triggering the alarm when they come to your home. So another way would be to distract the users, a little bit like uh, what we did with the seagull. I don't know if I have sound. No, I don't, but it's okay. So this is the tram in Amsterdam. And to distract the users for waiting during the, the, um, the commute, what they did, they put these little crocodiles and then you just hide one eye and you try to eat the people's head. So it's kind of cute yet weird thing to do. But the idea is like distracting users, give them something fun to, to, to play with. Of course, we can't all have, have little crocodiles in our application, so we need to find something else to do for our users while they're waiting. Uh, Instagram is doing a really good job at that. What happens is like, as soon as you've uh, taken the picture, 
it started getting uploading on their servers. So you're distracted. You're currently um, adding the comments, trying to find the perfect hashtag, mentioning people, clicking on all of the other buttons. So they're uploading it, and when you actually send posts, well, it's almost instant because it was already uploaded while you were distracted doing something else. But again, we're not all Instagram, so there's a few other things you could do. Skeleton screens is one solution. So skeleton screens is like, instead of, again, showing a blank page, you show what's the interface going to look like, and you lazy load the content into it. Working, not working, yes, a little bit slow. So this works as well. Um, test it on your users. There were a few articles in the like last month where people used skeleton screens and it didn't really work for the users. So again, everything I'm telling you today is like ideas, UI ideas, uh, patterns ideas, but I don't have your users, you don't have the same users as I have. So whenever you do something, test it on real users to see if actually it helps or if it makes things worse. It can happen as well. Another thing is like, instead of having those really, really boring blank situation, what Pinterest does, and I think Google borrowed that as well now, is like having the color, the main color of the, the picture you're going to display, they already display it. So text is cheap to display. Image is not, because you need to load of all of those images. So what they do is like, they load the text, load the um, color of the, the picture, and then when there's more connection, then they display the picture. Also, be careful with uh, skeleton screen. So they fixed it since, but this is what LinkedIn used to look like. Oh, crap. I don't have enough uh, contrast. But the idea is like, they changed the design, but the, the skeleton screen was on the previous design. So you had the sidebar on the right and the content on the left on the skeleton screen, and then you load it, and like, it's not the same thing. So the idea of a skeleton screen is still to kind of know a little bit what the interface will look like. So if you redesign it, think about redesigning your skeleton screens as well. So we also had an image gallery, not as fancy as Pinterest. So what we have is like a product where uh, mechanics can take pictures of the car and then uh, send you the picture of extra repairs. So you bring the car to um, a workshop, you bring it for something like brakes, and then the mechanic discovered there's something wrong with the engine. What they can do is take pictures, recording of the engine, send it to you, and then you accept the extra repairs or you refuse it. So we need to display your gallery because if you add something extra, you, we need to have new pictures and stuff like that. The first thing is like understanding the user concept. So, so here my user is not the end user, the car owner, but it's the mechanics into the, the factory. So we did some user research, we went there, and we discovered a few things. Data connection is crap in repair workshops. Really, really bad Wi-Fi, a lot of metal around, so it's really complicated to actually have a reliable connection. Also, they miss information sometimes because of latency, so the network one, but also the human ones. Sometimes the answer arrived, and the people responsible to organize it in the whole workshop didn't have time to tell them, okay, you can do the repairs. So we have two kind of latency, latency, human and network. And this is super important. They share the device. This is gonna be a nightmare because if they share the device, you have all of the pictures on the device. So you can keep all of the pictures on the device because otherwise at the end of the day, there's no storage anymore on the device. So again, discussing with my developers, trying to understand how this works. And yeah, that's the nightmare part. So. The medias, they are deleted from the device as soon as our servers get them. So it means that if you want to add extra images later, you need to reopen it and re-download re it, all of those images and videos, which might take time. Uh, then the good news is like, we have the size, the media type, the number of media into a JSON file, so that can go quickly. And then the thumbnails, they are from uh, Amazon S3, so that's, Kind of quick, but not that quick. So how did we build it? So first, the JSON file sends me how many images I have. So I can start building this skeleton screen. Ah, 
contrast. So there's this collecting screen here with all of the different um, little uh, images, so you know how many you have. I hope this one gets better, yeah. So then uh, into the JSON file, we have the um, type of media, so image or recording. So then we can not only have a skeleton screen, but already tell the users what kind of media it's gonna be. And since it's a little bit uh, annoying, we have this passing animation to show them that something is currently loading. So again, indicate that this doesn't, didn't froze, that they're expecting for the media to load. And then we display them one by one. As soon as the thumbnail arrives, we have the, the image. So it looks like that. Yay. And then again, in case of failure, because we also need to make sure we have something when there's failure, well, we have this. So we say after X seconds, if the image didn't load, we just have this little information to tell the users that the image didn't load. And last but not least, no user interruption. So you have to imagine, I had repairs, I send it to the server, but I need extra repairs, so I load the, um, the media gallery, but I might not actually need them. So what happens is that, okay. okay. <laughs> what? So what happens is that while it's loading, you can still click on new image. And then you take new images, and when you come back, there's a good chance the gallery already uploaded all the images in the background while you were taking new images. So again, smart distractions. Communicating what was expected here was really funny. You could use things like Envision to create prototypes. Then you can simulate this kind of waiting time using animated GIFs. So it's interesting, but it's really, really limited. You have to put all the, those, those frames. It's almost like animated something frame by frame. It's really, really long, and it's sometimes not worth all the pain to do that. Sometimes it's easier just to describe the animation you want. Also, to really stick fake prototype backfired during user testing. So that's another funny thing. I did some user testing. I wanted to test a lot of functionalities at the same time. And I put those kind of fake waiting time to see how user will react. But it was fake. I decided that there was going to be a 10 second waiting time. So what happened is like, I used the same prototype for developers and for user testing. But then I had like false positives and issue with the user testing because I didn't really want to test that. I wanted to test the other functionalities. But anytime someone, someone would come back to the gallery, they had this 10 second fake waiting time. So in the end, I had like some comments about the waiting time. Like, yeah, it's super long. And I, yeah, I know I did that on purpose. I wanted to test it, thank you. So be careful. What I want to do next time is like, test the performance but on an actual coded prototype, not my fake Envision prototype, and a river real user connection. So I spent quite a lot of time telling you about making things fast. But again, do we really want that from a philosophical point of view also? Do we, we really want to embrace a world where we're building stuff and enhancing user expectation and then they expect things to go really fast always and then like shooting into our own feet or something like that. Also, do we always want to make things faster? Is fast always the best solution? For instance, um, in banking, sometimes you don't expect fast. Sometimes things need to take time. I come from a country, so I come from France where banking takes a lot of time. If you want to do a banking transfer, it's two days. So I'm always laughing about these like super evil movies where they transfer one billion uh, euros and you see the little ones like, yeah, transfer like, nope, that doesn't happen in France, sorry. So my expectation, the mental model I was born with and I grew up with is like banking takes time. Then I got this N26, it is a German company and the first time I paid with the card, I had this little notification about how much did I pay. I was like, 
what the hell? This can't be that fast. There must be a trick. The money must still be on my account or something like that. So it triggered a lot of questions because for me, banking takes time because that's the, the model in my mind. So again, depending on your user expectation, maybe fast is not always the best solution. Again, another example into banking, uh, Wells Fargo, they built this uh, banking app and you could uh, register, with, not, not register, log in into app using an um, eye scanner. <laughs> Again, thanks movies like Minority Report and all of those movies, when you see someone doing an eye scan, it's like they put their just it takes time into those movies. Because it's a movie, because they need to make you understand that something is happening, so what happened here is like, it took less than one second and user weren't convinced. They had this kind of, again, image that scanning an eye must take time. So for security reason, it wasn't possible. So they did some user testing and users say like, yeah, it's nice, but I'm not gonna use it because I don't trust the security of that. It was secure, it's again, but perception. Another example is something that was documented as the kayak effect. So what happens, like we value things when they get time. And like Kayak and all of these other websites, they are supposed to scrap the internet, the whole internet, the big internet, for cheap prices. And you expect that to kind of take time, right? So they had a super algorithm that was able to scrap it really, really quickly. But again, you also expect it to be slow to scrap the internet and all the other thing to find the best offer. They expect it to take time because when there's time into that, there's value. So this was documented as the kayak effect. They again introduced fake waiting time so that user would trust a product. And again, conversation, it takes time. So if you want, for instance, to make a boat, chatbot, so I know that those are trendy, feel more natural, well, you couldn't give the answer right away. We have the technology for that. If you have the network, you can just throw the answer and it's okay. But the principle in behind a chatbot is that it's supposed to kind of feel like human. And sometimes when you, usually when you ask human a question, it takes time to answer. So if you want a chatbot that feels a little bit more natural, you need this kind of little trick. Like this is totally fake. It could reply in less than a second. But now we want it to feel human, so we add this extra waiting time to again make it feel like a real conversation. So, in the end, we designed and developed in a privileged environment. Sometimes we need a kind of a reality check, like what is it like for our users? My users are into car workshops with really crappy connection. My users are nurses into hospitals with really, really, really crappy screens and stuff like that. So it's nice that we have all of those tools and super connection at work, but we still need to test it on real users in real conditions because they, their environment is not our environment. And again, we need to communicate and develop and work together a little bit more. Usually what happens when it comes to this kind of state is like designer is designing the best scenario state. And then <laughs> if there's failure, well, it's the developer job to kind of try to come up with a solution. But no, that's not always the best thing to do. As a designer, we also need to make sure to design for failure, for poor latency, for like really poor connection, for no connection, thinking about what happens if we're offline, stuff like that. It's our role, my role as a designer to do that as well. And then perceived performance might not be the true priority on the agenda. Usually when you're at this conference, you're telling people about super cool stuff. But so in real life, what happened is like, it took six months to have this into my application. I kind of sneaked it into a release. <laughs> so it might take time. The developer, they were ready, but it wasn't on the agenda. So again, it might take time for those things, but be patient because eventually it will happen. And again, we can't all be Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest. We can't all do these really, really dribble-like, dreamy interfaces. And it's okay, it's also super rewarding to do something really, really nice for real users, even if it's not like this perfect dribble shot. It's perfectly fine. Thank you very much.
Questions? Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for questions. Very nice work, by the way, and really inspiring. I mean, um, it's, it's good to, uh, to bring this perspective how it's not how quick it is, but more like how quick it feels. Um, I want to take it one step further about the really hardcore situations that go above the five second rule. And uh, I'm working for a company, I'm going for ASML, we are dealing with big amounts of data, and we want, we often have our customers, they want to have a report that has to process millions of records to be generated. I want to ask you if you have experience with situations that when people ask for something, you don't deliver it immediately, you go more like the, the waiter approach. You say, I've got your order, I will come back to you when it's done. Yeah. And this can take, I don't know, even, even half an hour. Do you have experience with these kind of situations uh, in, uh, in your, uh, your work? Yeah, usually it's about informing users. It's a little bit like the example with the bank. If someone had told me somewhere into the process that it will take no time, it's immediate. Like educating users about that is something you can do. If users are not dumb, we used to kind of know it takes time to download things and to upload things. We know we kind of have this, again, perception on how long it might take. So if you need to download, I don't know how many megabytes of data, first you can tell them like, you, you are going to, we are processing this, we are putting this amount of data together. And if they see that there's like, I don't know, one gigabyte of uh, data, well, you understand, you tell them why, like this is a big file. And then another thing, I think, who does that? Uh, Envision prototypes, sometimes they're really, really heavy. So what they do is, if they can put it on the page and you can download it right away, it's okay. But also what they tell you is like, this is going to take time, so you have this little pop-up, and they tell you, we're going to send you the link by email. So this way, the, you don't have to wait on the interface like for one hour or something like that. And you get these notifications into your email. So. But again, it's mostly about educating users about what takes time and making them understand why and how they will get delivered. If the, for instance, in your example, if the waiter is telling you like, yeah, we've got a lot of orders and we're doing fresh food, you know, we don't have all of this prepared stuff, so it will take a little time for you to have your salad, but it will be a fresh salad, something like that. Most of people are willing to wait because quality, stuff like that. Hello. Hello. Do you feel this kind of uh, improvements in the website affect the usability of this website? Sorry, I didn't get Do you question. feel that this kind of um, improvements, yeah. uh, visual improvements, affect the usability of the site in terms of, for example, people that cannot see all colors or people that have issues with um, the large amount of animations? Yeah. Um, this, yeah, that's a good point about accessibility and stuff like that. The thing is, you, it's another question, but again, if you do like super heavy animation, like the one I showed you on work, for instance, you need to have indeed something to trigger it on and off. But if the animations are really, really small and really slow, usually what happens is it actually helps user understand the interface a little bit better. Because it's, that's another conference, but what happens with small animation is that it offloads the thing from the brain to the eye. So, for instance, if you have curtains, if they are closed and then opened, your brain needs to think that something happened between the two states, like the, the curtains, they went down or up, something like that. If you do a small animation, like curtains or here it would be long, like opening menus and stuff like that, you see the animation, so your brain doesn't need to do all of the work, it's your eyes that sees the animation, and then you understand like, okay, I went from this state to this state because I actually see the, the connection. This is a little bit why we also have like smooth scrolling and stuff like that. You click on an anchor, you are at the end of the page, no scrolling or something, you're wondering like, 
am I in a new page or am I still on the page where I am, what happened, stuff like that. If you just have this really small scrolling animation, and I'm not telling you about taking control of the whole browser and doing this crazy stuff, just like small animation, you understand like, I was here, I'm here, and I kind of see the in-betweens. So if you're doing like super heavy animations, of course, you might need uh, something to switch them off. And then for small ones, I think it's kind of okay. Time's up, sorry. You can still come to me after and ask me a question directly if you want. We've got time for one more question. Yeah, okay. One more. <laughs> Green Which ones, is going to be my twice. question. <laughs> uh, tell me, Stephanie, that, um, there was a time when a couple of days, a couple of days to wait for an email was was okay. Then uh, then we got into instant messengers, mm. and you start to get a little bit antsy if you don't get an answer within five minutes. You think you're being ignored. Now we're talking about how we're talking about seconds. For, for sites to load and we've still got to try and bridge that gap because patient level, patients levels are dropping all the time. Um, do you see that? Is, is that your experience in your work? Yeah. That patient levels are, are dropping? Totally, because people can, uh, it depends, like end users like us, yeah, we're super like really, really, really high on, we want the reward, like right now we want to answer really quickly. But I see that if you go to more B2B thing, like I work for the, a lot of company that still has Microsoft old school interfaces that literally take one minute to load all the data and the users are so used to it being super slow that just a small improvement of speed make them super happy. So you have these really two kind of branches, I would say, like the end customers like us, if you go and do something for everybody, like Twitter, Instagram, stuff like that, you actually have really high expectations, but you also have this whole kind of part of the web, which would be like web applications, stuff like that, more for people in two different industries. And they're not as impatient as we are today. But again, it's all about the world you want to build. Do you want to build a world where everyone is impatient? Like we have Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook playing with our fear of missing out. You've got this psychological thing, the loops, you've got tw uh, Twitter and Facebook who actually delay the notification because if you get too many notifications, you get the instant reward. So they play with that. And it's kind of getting really, really dark and shady. So this is like patterns, this is, those are tools. You do whatever you want with the tools. You can do something really, really great, or you can do something shady and, and, eth and eth ethical. It really depends on who you are, the kind of product you want to build. So we're, we don't always know what we want, but we know we want it now. Yeah. Right, hold on a minute. Because Stephanie, oh, yeah, I could see you were you were really jealous, weren't you, with, with Jeremy? Well, <laughs> you've come all of this way, and ladies and gentlemen, I've got to tell you, my garden is absolutely empty now. I've dug everything up. So, Thank Stephanie, you. please, the olive olive branch of peace, <laughs> may you. it take you on a, a peaceful road home. Thank you very Thank much, you. ladies and gentlemen.